Thank you all for coming. Thank you to the organizers for putting together an in-person workshop. Um, so technically, I gave this talk three times here. It's probably the same title. And um, but I'm going to try to, since it's a fluid workshop, I assume, just get to the chase of Euler equation. So <coughs> we just recall the uh, vorticity form. The Euler equation. <coughs> so the vorticity, which is again the curl of the velocity, is transported and stretched by the uh, by the velocity. And because the velocity is divergence free and omega is the curl of the velocity, we can recover the full curl uh, using the so called Bio Savar law, which is this formula. So this system is this is 3 1. <coughs> And uh, a, we're interested in the, the problem of finite time singularity formation and a well-known fact. So have a theorem due to Bill Katzel-Maida says that uh, a classical solution, I'll tell you exactly what classical means, Omega on an interval zero to t star develops a singularity. And it ceases to be classical at t star, but then only if the limit as t goes to t star integral is. Okay, so that means that uh, you can extend the solution uh, so long as omega remains bounded point once, right? And uh, so <coughs> so I guess that you know when, when one thinks about singularity, the the Key question is how you know so the, the key question for singularity is how do we make omega grow? Okay. And when we now look at the equation. Okay, so this is transport term, and this is, which means it doesn't grow omega pointwise. So even without the divergence free condition, right, it can grow pointwise by um, transport. But then there's the stretching term, um, for which if we Think about pointwise growth along trajectories. So, so along trajectories, and this um, along trajectory is an important statement. Uh, growth occurs so at a point, at a moving point. Growth occurs if this uh, quantity is positive. Right, so omega has to be aligned with some expanding direction of u. Okay, so that means, you know, because the, the, the velocity is divergence free, the trace of the gradient is zero. So u has to have some expanding directions and contracting directions. It has to have some positive eigenvalue and negative eigenvalues. And uh, the growth along trajectories, which means when you compose with the flow map, will occur only when uh, 
only when this is positive. Which means that the omega, its main, okay, the best case, it's parallel to the positive eigen direction of the gradient. <coughs> Um, okay, but of course that, you know, that fact, because of the, the transport term, or because of the transport, points where uh, U is expanding, it means also particles are leaving those regions. Okay, so this is not, so there seems to be some kind of problem between these two terms, right? So even if, you know, even if a point in Eulerian, remains uh, for some time in a region where this is positive or very large, it may be immediately ejected from that region. Okay. So our first step, if you wanna understand the question, how do we make omega grow point-wise, we're basically going to split ourselves into two um, sub-questions is, <coughs> is we'll study the, I call this one star and double star. So we have to study how the solution of star given you and grow. And then we have to study is, is that scenario, so scenario means some kind of situation where omega u looks a certain way and omega looks a certain way and there's growth from this equation. Is that scenario consistent with double star? The actual relation between u and omega. Okay, so that's, um, sort of the, what, what we think about. And <coughs> so previous results um, that I had with a number of collaborators, so um, relates to, to this question. And in particular, in studying the dynamic of this question, of this equation and uh, of this relation, you can make certain reductions by assuming that the uh, vorticity is irregular in certain ways, right? So um, to, I can just give you a schematic. So in a paper that, that I had in which we constructed a self-similar blow up, there were basically two so we use two types of irregularities. So I'm gonna spend maybe 20 minutes explaining this point. So I'm just gonna write it out for now. So there are two types of irregularity we previously used. <coughs> one is uh, uh, one is in uh, in the direction of the flow. And that's precisely to, uh, to stop the you know, regularizing effect that I explained of the transport term. And this is I can write in, in theta. And the second is in the, in the radial direction. Um, the radial direction is really the, the spherical radi radial direction. And that's to, to approximate uh, to approximate the, the Bios of Arla. So in fact, you could think of the first one as you know, a way to simplify the star and the second one as a way to simplify um, double star. Um, that, that's what I'm going to explain now. Okay. 
All right, so so let's let's try to get an understanding of um, so understanding. <clears throat> That's the, the vorticity equation, but I assume now that u is a given velocity field. Okay. So this title is okay. It's, it's um, arrogant to write that we're really gonna understand this. Really, we only understand very, very little um, about this. It's really some one dimensional examples that we understand a little bit. <laughs> um, so this is just by a series of examples. So let me give some examples. So uh, the first example, so this is all in 1D. <clears throat> so the first example is the simplest possible example you could think of, where u is just the, the identity. Right? So u of x is x. Then omega satisfying this equation. And Okay, if you look at the maximum of omega, omega grows exponentially. That's, there's, there's nothing to say about growth um, per se in this equation. But it, it turns out that if you, if you think about this as a, just a local, uh, as a local approximation, if you don't think about, because obviously globally, the velocity is not going to be looking like this. So if you think about this as like a local approximation, then we have to we write the you can write the formula in this case. So omega x of t is just e to the t, so that's the growth times its initial data. Right? So you see there's a it's growing at this speed and it's expanding at that same speed, right? And a key observation is that even though omega looks like it's growing. The derivative of omega remains bounded. If it's bounded initially, right? And what that means is that there's there's really two cases you can think of, right? If if the initial data is zero at zero, then omega remains bounded, so it's uniformly bounded. In the ball of radius one around zero, if you fix a region around zero, omega will be uniformly bounded for all time. <clears throat> and if it's not zero, if it's not zero, it will grow you know, exponentially just at zero. But it'll become flat. It becomes relatively flat. Okay, and becomes relatively flat is important depending on if we, what the relationship between u and omega is. Okay, so this is um, so the first example of what what this term can do. So this is some, something just to keep in mind. Oh, I should mention that the, <clears throat> the thing about uh, regularity in the flow, in the direction of the flow, regularity in theta, clearly if omega zero is not smooth, omega zero is not smooth, if omega zero near zero has like a cusp, There's not much board space, I don't know. <laughs> no. um, let me just make a remark. If omega zero is not smooth at zero, so it's like x to the alpha at zero, alpha is less than one, then it grows exponentially near in a neighborhood of zero, right? And it's not flat, right? So it grows in a, it, 
It's being flat, it's going to be cleared right now. Why it's a bad thing for it to be flat. So then you have growth, exponential growth. Zero in the non flat way. <laughs> the reason that it's important is that the, the velocity is actually some average of omega against something that's integral to zero. So if it becomes flat, then the, uh, the velocity becomes much weaker. So I'll explain this now on a, on a nonlinear problem. So the second example, this is the first example, is a nonlinear one. So, so you take the velocity just to be, so this is on, on the circle. So you just take the velocity to be the projection to sine of x of, of omega. Okay, so this is uh, one step above just fixing the velocity, right? So you take it something depending on omega, but in some relatively simple way. So in this case, uh, we call this lambda t. Then the equation becomes. Okay, and by uh, rescaling time right, to something else, you can just forget about this lambda of t and just imagine it like this. The lambda of t is just gonna speed up the, the velocity. <coughs> and if you think about the, you know, from our, the, the picture we had here, there's really two things that can happen. So, so the, Function is living on minus pi to pi. The velocity is pushing out from zero. Um, and okay, we, there's basically two types of data we can have. We can have data that vanishes at zero or data that doesn't vanish at zero. Okay, maybe it's maximum at zero. Right, so you could have data that looks like this. or data that looks like this. Yeah, of course, it could be slightly different. But um, essentially, those are the two cases you need to think about. And in this case, there's actually no growth coming from this, even though near zero, Again, this is positive when you have you have an ODE with a positive coefficient that's you know, giving you exponential growth. But the uh, the fact that you're transporting omega and there's omega vanishes here means in a sense that the, the derivative of omega is uniformly bounded in a region around zero. And so there's no growth. So by the way, this okay, so the exact calculation of this is in a recent review paper I was posted a couple of days ago with the Theo Driva. So this, this is not just uh, hand waving, um, but I'm not going to do the calculations now. <laughs> not the purpose of this talk. So there's really no growth, no growth in the sense that solution is uniformly bounded in C1 for all time if it's initially C1. And here you have growth of this problem, but you see what happens, right? The growth as time goes on, as, as tau increases in this equation, the solution becomes more and more flat, right? It becomes some big guy like that. Right? So if omega is looking like this, and you integrate it against something, a kernel like this, then the velocity is going to zero. It's, it's inconsistent that this thing actually grow. So this 
this equation for C1 data, so this you have global regularity <coughs> for C1 data, unconditional. And so that, that's a, a simple example of how if you, if you don't have the transport term, obviously there's, there's a, a finite time law, but the transport term actually uh, regularizes in this, in this set. Okay. <coughs> this, this is really the, 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 the second case here is really the case of when omega becomes flat and you, you integrate it against something, it's not only that it becomes flat, actually, it becomes essentially even um, around the maximum, around zero, and sine of y is an odd curve. Okay. Um, I'll give you guys a second example. Oh, should say one thing. Uh, here also, this remark applies. Okay, so I, I'll, I'll, I'm going to erase this remark in a second. So here also, if you take <coughs> so taking C alpha data. Again, I want to emphasize it's it's really about having C alpha data in the direction of the flow. So in the direction of the, of the velocity field in 1D, that's only one direction. It doesn't matter. So here also taking C alpha data or any alpha less than one, you can get a singularity. Okay, and there's a, a second way that you could do it is that you just say, I'm going to define this problem, not on, on the circle, but on zero to five. I'm just going to forget that I, want, I don't want periodic boundary conditions anymore. I just want to solve it on zero to pi. In that case, this uh, flat solution does also blow up, right? So if you're on the circle, if you don't put any boundary, um, so if you put a boundary, or you take data that's C alpha in the, in the direction of the flow, um, you should expect that the, the transport term will be much weaker and the, uh, the stretching term will win and there will be a singularity. Okay, uh, any questions so far? Just a small one. So, uh, and these examples, are you, does something interesting happens when there is no symmetry in the data? I mean, you so uh, you can kind of decompose any function that way. But uh, yeah, if you study this, so in fact, if you look at the, the, the argument, you can write a closed equation on lambda, and you can see that no matter what the data is, as long as it's C1, there's no uh, no growth <coughs> Okay, so now I mentioned this very simple fix of this problem that does not force you to take uh, non-smooth data. So uh, the original. original minus pi to pi. So a, a kind of simple fix to change the parity in the problem. Because you take U of x t oops. So instead of sine there, I'm going to take cosine in the problem. And this may seem like that's bringing arbitrary models, but these are really um, models of different type of symmetries you can have in the Euler equation. So if you if you impose uh, if you have an equation 
in which the velocity has the opposite parity to omega. Right? So here, if the velocity and the omega have the same parity, right? omega is odd, or u is odd, omega is even, u is um, even, so zero in that case. <coughs> and here, u and omega have the opposite parity. So this is the... And it's a, a slightly, uh, slightly um, um, technical computation in general. It turns out that there's some simple blow-up solution for this equation. Um, but you can have, here you can have a singularity from smooth -tick. It's not immediately obvious, and the, the culprit is this flat case, right? So the, it's not immediately obvious because exactly flat, if omega was exactly flat, this would be zero, right? But what actually happens is that it looks uh, more like this, and it's growing, maintaining the same shape. And so it looks, you know, it's become, it is true that it's becoming kind of flat relative to its maximum, um, but it still develops a singularity, right? Because you see that the negative part of the cosine, right? so the cosine looks like that. The negative part of the cosine is with the smaller part of the, of the vorticity. This is slightly complicated to see, but okay, it's, it's not difficult to check. Okay, so these are um, a few ways in which you can, um, in which this irregularity in the direction of the flow um, comes up. And this is actually the, for me, conceptually, the, that was the main difficulty in um, trying to find like smooth blow ups is finding a scenario where um, you don't have to take irregular behavior in the direction of the flow or a boundary. But it turns out that if you, you're working in the right scenario, um, you can do that. So maybe I'll, I'll mention at the end of the talk, a uh, scenario where you can remove this type of singularity. Okay. <coughs> Um, so now I want to talk for 10 or 15 minutes about um, the second part. So kind of, kind of got an idea from these computations about at least in 1D what happens to, in this uh, equation. And now we want to get a better understanding of this point. <laughs> okay, so to, to understand this, the main okay, the main culprit is this part, right? So the, the main thing to understand is the, the inverse of plus. Okay, so in terms of regularity, there's probably not everything there is to know about this uh, operator. Um, so formally, right, so formally, we always gain uh, two derivatives. When we invert the Laplacian, and uh, one way to see this is to check on the homogeneous functions. So if you consider, if you solve psi, Laplace psi is f, if 
that is alpha homogeneous, right? Then for formally, formally, psi is two plus alpha homogeneous. So homogeneous is the, the usual thing we're, we're saying. F is alpha homogeneous means F is lambda X lambda alpha. That's what homogeneous lambda is a number. Um, but this this breaks down. So this so this breaks down when alpha is an integer. Right? So if you have exactly the integer regularity, then, uh, okay, which is unfortunate fact of life, fortunate for some people, um, then uh, you don't have this uh, Schauder theory on the, exactly on the integer spaces. And the reason for this is, so the, so the reason for this, Is the resonance. That's, we may debate the, the use of this term um, with the spherical harmonics. In particular, if you were to split, say, you know, the the, the case, the case alpha equals zero, by the way, is is kind of special for the for the vorticity. Because formally, if if the vorticity is uh, zero homogeneous, and this is propagated by the equation, right? because you can count it, that if omega is zero <laughs> homogeneous, then u should be one homogeneous. So this is one minus one plus zero, and this is minus one plus one plus zero. Right? So formally, the, the the zero homogeneous case is is um, special. Um, so if we focus on that case, so for example, <coughs> then if we solve uh, this equation and we, we split F into two pieces, so we can make its projection onto the second order spherical harmonics and its orthogonal projection, right? So this, this just means that, say, in, in two dimensions, if we write um, f like this, right? So we can write uh, any L two function this way, and uh, so p two is just the case k two, and p two perp is the rest. Okay. See what I'm saying? <clears throat> so for solving uh, this problem, there's no issue with inverting, even when it's exactly zero homogeneous, there's no issue with inverting this part. Right? So this makes sense. Right? So this, this makes sense as, a, as, uh, as an operator. Right? Because uh, what, what I'm saying is that the, the Laplacian, so the case uh, k equal two are precisely the um, spherical harmonics. The spherical harmonics are just e to the i k theta r to the k. So if, if this thing is zero homogeneous and we want to output something that's too homogeneous, you have to get rid of the kernel. You have to get rid of the kernel of the Laplacian, which are exactly the, on the, the second shell, because you're gaining two derivatives. Okay. <coughs> now, what it means is that, so what it means is that as alpha approaches zero, okay, we can, you know, taking the inverse Laplacian of this whole thing, um, makes sense, then 
this part should develop some kind of uh, singularity. So it should uh, develop a singular term. Right. So using this, okay, so this was. Uh, so uh, notice that this is the, the issue about regularity in R. Right. So this is in 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 any dimension. Right. So this is. Right. Um, but okay, so so uh, I forgot to say this that if for some reason you could say that this was zero, right, then you could uh, define exactly at alpha equals zero. You could define the scale invariant solutions to this equation. So you could define. Uh, zero homogeneous solutions you can study the properties and uh, that was work we did with NGGR with several papers in different contexts and that you could say is like the next order so if this part is the because uh, it's one over alpha this is like minus one order when alpha is small this is the zeroth order when alpha is small so you could think of this as like, if alpha goes to zero, you could think of this as an expansion. Right? So now, uh, here. <coughs> you can think of this The key thing is that this has a very nice form and it has uh, you know, comparison principles, things like that in R. So this is like the one over alpha term. Okay. And this is like the order one term. And if you restrict to the case where um, if you uh, do the right thing, you can uh, split this further into simpler uh, part and you can do a full expansion. So you can write it as the reason for one, two is kind of um, not, not necessary. Um, so you can get some expansion in alpha. Okay. And the idea from the, uh, the one of the singularity papers was just to retain this term. Okay. So if we take alpha small, we inject this term in the Euler equation, we hit it with everything we saw from the, the 1D uh, case, then we can say something. Okay, so. So when we, um, when formally, we write, we, we take full Euler equation, and then we, uh, we just um, retain only the, uh, Order one over alpha terms. Then we, we got some equation here, which did not fix, by the way, we have not fixed the problem of, even though we simplified the 
a non-local relation, right? we only retain um, the U minus one term, so it's so like this term of the inverse Laplacian. We did not fix the problem of, of this stuff, right? We did not fix the problem that there can be regularization from the transport term, right? And in fact, that uh, shows up very clearly in the, in the case of axisymmetry with no swirl. Um, in the case of axisymmetry with no swirl, you retain uh, something like this. I'll just, I'll just write it. It becomes something like this. Okay, so I'm leaving out the nonlinear term, which is something that. Um, Become something like this, <clears throat> which again has has this sort of structure in it. So there's a there's again some some lambda of t here, t and r, right? But the main thing is that this uh, angular transport term is still regularized. We haven't fixed that problem by doing this expansion in alpha. You only fix that by further imposing that the data is irregular in theta, which is uh, what we actually do. The interesting thing here is that the regularity level exactly matches the that you need to impose, exactly matches the um, the known global regularity results for axisymmetry no swirl solutions. So here you would have global regularity. Once omega is C one third in theta. No matter what you do, you do whatever you want with alpha in R, there's no way you can make this blow up unless you make the data very non smooth in theta, right? which is uh, what was done. And I, I should remark that this was also applied. Uh, to the, uh, to the case of what's an S with boundary or uh, axisymmetric Euler in, in a cylinder, um, case with boundary by how and Chen, oh, it's sorry, Chen and Hal. Um, who's here? I don't know where it's right there. Um, <clears throat> and uh, with boundary for for this reduced equation, um, just for the reduced equation, again, there's no reason that you need to take um, irregular data and theta, just like in that um, in that one D model I, I wrote there. Okay. Um, okay, so I have till 10, right? Yeah. <coughs> okay, so now um, I'll say a couple more things. So, so generally speaking, and I, I'd be very happy to be proven wrong. So generally speaking, If we only retain the, the leading order term in the in the expansion here, which is just the, the effect of the projection onto the second shell, um, I don't think we can. Uh, so, so this okay. So that should be very careful what I say. So. This can be applied, you know, to the Euler equation, to the 3D Euler equation without putting any symmetries or anything. And one should, this equation, in my opinion, should be given some time and really studied. Um, but it, if 
you know, my intuition is not wrong, probably this equation always suffers the, the global regularity um, when you just do that. If you take smooth data in the angles. Right, so, so we should have global regularity unless we without boundary or anything i'm talking about the free space we should have global regularity um, when the data is smooth in the okay, so that you can't get up get out of this regularizing mechanism just by um, taking your expansion out all that does is you understand better what these terms are what what you means um but you don't get out of that just by taking the first term that's that's what i think could be could be wrong um but all the examples that we know of which are very few in reality um seem to tell us that so for example so for example if we only retain, if we go to axisymmetry with swirl or the Boussinesque system, and we just study this equation, so this leading order equation, the solutions are always globally regular. If, if you're smooth in there. Smooth. Smooth. In theta, I mean, solutions are always possible. Okay. Any question? Okay, we'll see the obvious thing I'm going to say next is that you should, you know. You should cut, okay, go to the next order and see what happens. Right, so you should really um, add one more term in your expansion and see if it's possible to get a singularity that's um, smooth in theta. Right? This will not resolve the regularity in R because you still have to do this expansion, which um, relies on alpha being small. But again, from our experience, which again is limited. Um, it doesn't appear that regularity in R is as uh, decisive as regularity in theta. But okay, that's a difficult thing to make make precise. <laughs> Made it precise to solve the global the blow up problem for smooth data. <coughs> So, so I'm just going to say that this a forthcoming work with uh, Federico Pascalotto. I always forget. I hope I spelled his name right. What's that? Seems correct. Yeah. I mean, I, I always have difficulty with the salary. You do an A? Yeah, the U A. Yeah, that's perfect. Yes. Perfect. Okay. 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 Um, I, I should say, okay, so, sorry. Is that the, the way that this manifests, this irregularity in theta, manifests here? And in all of those cases, that the, the data has to be irregular along like a line or a plane or something like that. So here, the data is irregular. And you, you can remove the plane along at least a full line. It has to be, it can't be just uh data that's irregular at a point in a nice way maybe there's a way to do it you know at a point but have it very very you know 
not in the correct like, scaling uh, spaces, right? But if you're trying to work in the right spaces, then you need an uh, uh, irregularity in the data along, uh, uh, along some line or along the plane. Um, that's what irregularity in theta means. So, so we consider the Boussinesque system. Boussinesque on R2. And okay, for some symmetries, then we can uh, find self-similar profile. And, uh, and solutions that are, are nearby since uh, it's not the profile itself. So you can find a self-similar profile, which is smooth in capital R, so R to the alpha and theta. In particular, the data particular um, omega zero and the gradient density. Okay, so maybe just if you don't know what the Boussinesq system is, just think of the density as another component of the velocity. Okay, so I'll just write it. It's like, even though okay, this is for Boussinesq, not axisymmetric either. Um, uh, so this thing is uh, C infinity on R2, except at zero. And uh, intersected with C1 alpha for some small alpha. Small. And you can find again some continuum of alphas. So it's a family of profiles. And okay, so actually give the computations is kind of a nightmare. Not, not a nightmare, just quite long. Um, but I, I'll just tell you that it uses the, so we use the second order <coughs> approximation to the of blah, blah. And um, so that we have to we have to retain sort of several terms in the expansion. So omega becomes like some alpha times some function. And row zero okay, scale is correct, divide by r is. Uh, some order order one function, okay, which, and the, all right, so uh, I forgot to say one thing. So the, <coughs> so let, let me just write the expand. <coughs> so you have to determine all three of these functions at the beginning. So this is kind of a complicated um, construction, not, not very complicated, but it's a little bit tedious. But the, the key thing is that this first one to leading order is stationary. So I told you that if you only retain, so it's kind of weird when you have, um, when you have an expansion, uh, when, when I said that, when you have an expansion, <coughs> when I say to you that U is L minus one of omega, zero of omega, and then I tell you, I'm gonna take the density to be like this, then you're right to ask, you know, how, how is it consistent that these three terms balance each other, right? Because, the, the P0 is <coughs> introducing some very large term in the equation, but P0 is essentially, 
it's steady to leading off. Right, so it's uh, because the, the zeroth order equation or the minus one order equation is globally regular, uh, as I said, it actually has a good number of steady states. And uh, the first expansion, first term in the expansion is, uh, is a steady part. And then the, the blow up is some interaction between the next terms and the previous. So um, it remains to, so we're still you know, writing this up now. So hopefully maybe this month it will be done. Never know though, uh, how long it might take, but hopefully this month. Um, uh, but it remains to figure out, uh, okay, so sorry. A little more precise. So it remains to figure out how you can remove the irregularity in R. But um, I guess we'll see what happens. Thank you. Yeah. So, Tarek, so uh, in this case, the, the profile is moving the angle direction along the flow, right? Yeah. How do you weaken the, the direction? It, the, the, we don't weaken the direction. So the direction is that's I guess uh, thank you for saying that. So the, the direction is not the, the angular direction is not perturbative. Okay. So you, you actually construct the profile. So these are not functions I could write down. So you have to construct them by some process. So the angular the Angular term is not as uh, as before, just a perturbative. It means, I mean, this this isn't so simple, right? It's a time dependent. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is it not, I mean, because you said it's a steady flow. It's not like there's a steady flow there, which is a background flow. It's actually. Uh, oh, no, so, so, so steady. Okay, the, the steady one. But, um, it's steady at, at its order. So it produces things of lower order. You know what I'm saying? Like steady at order one, actually for the, for the real time dependent equation. Yeah. Um, but then, okay, that's what I mean to leading order. But it's, uh, yeah. So there, there's also, okay, so I, I forgot to say this. There's also some, there's some direction, right? So there's some number here. So when I said about constructing the profile, there's some number that we have to vary as a coefficient of the P0. And uh, it has to be, have a certain sign. If it's in the wrong sign, then it's uh, you're really in like a stable regime. So I kind of liken it to that um, when you have, uh, you know, this thing about having hot over cold, Versus cold over hot. Right, one of them is the stable regime. That's that's the sign of the density. Right? So one sign of the density gives you uh, no profile, and the other sign gives you a profile. Yeah. Yes. So uh, uh, can you draw a picture? Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So. Um, it's the usual thing. So, so, so omega is is odd in, in x and y. Like that thing. I can't. I don't think I can draw a correct a, a good picture that will show what's going on. To be honest, um, to be brutally honest, there's no clear reason why this works to me right now. Uh, but um, uh, so I'll, I'll just tell you the symmetries. Right? That, that helps. Omega is odd in x and y, and the, the density rho is 
it depends on what equation we're talking about. So it can be even in line. Right. And, <coughs> and this background, okay, so I didn't I didn't write it correctly. So the, the background is some large function. So a star is some large number. Um, uh, so rho to leading order. It's like a star times x times a function. So it's so a so so at zero and f of zero is not f of zero. Right. So um, if we think a star is so leading order just um, a star times times x. So I did it the wrong way. So, so this way. So gravity is this way. <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. Yes. <clears throat> then um, it's like you have a, a strong uh, around zero. Okay, so you have like a strong unstable temperature profile in the background. Sorry, that's not. <laughs> is, is it reasonable to think about it like this? If you have alpha, uh, you know, non-integer or, or approaching uh, like a small number, you introduce like or you you have like new degrees of freedom in the system, which uh, enable you to to form the singularity, which become inaccessible for smooth function. Um. I agree that when alpha is equal to zero, if there is a like an extra degree of freedom. Um, but I think when once alpha is non-zero, um, I, I interpret it as a way. It's just a method to, to find something, but I don't know if it really introduces new stuff. You know what I'm saying? Camilo? Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was just uh, confused by the statement of the theorem because you say, in particular, since it's moving up to the alpha and theta, then it's in C1 alpha. But but is that because of the particular shape? Because I mean, omega could be just R to the power alpha, for instance. That's only Hölder, right? Um, right. Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. C1, you're right. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. I was writing the velocity. Sorry. Oh, okay. It's very confusing. Yes. Okay, okay. Yeah, okay. Oh, yeah, okay. The velocity, of course, gets one. one. Yeah, one more. One. Okay. Well, it looks nicer that way. What is yeah. Well, well, <laughs> so, 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 yeah, if that's your last, my last question would be can you do like CK alpha? And now, yeah. Okay. <laughs> right. So, C <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This was completely. So, CK alpha. That's a very good question. Um, I think that um, I think that uh, one has to, so as I said at the beginning, there's some resonance with these harmonics. But every integer value, you have some something large coming out. Um, so you, you know, you have to figure out how to do that. I think it's. Seems a little difficult because of the, there's a, a difference between the zero case and the, the higher integers, but maybe. Yeah, but these things look at infinity. Ah, yeah, the the, uh, the profile is. Uh, uh, Let's say in sub similar color. Yeah, so omega zero is like has some. Some scaling row zero has the and these are functions mm, roughly lambda is positive or negative. Um, lambda of alpha is positive, yeah. So lambda of alpha is on the order of alpha. Okay. Yeah. 
I have a silly question. Uh, you mentioned that in axisymmetric no square, there's global regularity when you have C one third. Yeah. Does that have anything to do with the one third of one saga, or is it just a coincidence? No, no, that's, that's dimension That's a, right. So the one saga thing is dimension dependent, uh, independent. Sorry, and this is dimension dependent. So I think four dimensions is some other number, maybe one half or something. Four and three and so on. It's four or three because it's one one. Uh oh. <laughs> okay, so let's just take a break. Thank you very much.